the call to order the March 6th, 2019 James City County Planning Commission meeting. Mr. Holt, will you please call the roll? Ms. Dowdy. Here. Ms. Dowdy represents the Stonehouse District. Ms. Leverance, who is an at-large member, can't be with us this evening. Mr. Polster. Here. Mr. Polster represents the Jamestown District. Mr. Haldeman. Here. Mr. Haldeman <clears throat> represents the Berkeley District. Mr. O'Connor. Here. Mr. O'Connor is an at-large member. Mr. Croft. Here. Mr. Croft represents the Powhatan District. Mr. Schmidt. Here. Mr. Schmidt represents the Roberts District and is the and is currently the chair of the Planning Commission. I'm Paul Holt, Director of Community Development and Planning for the County, and sitting to my left is Mr. Rex Halaven, our Deputy County Attorney. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Uh, now we move on to the public comment period of tonight's meeting. This time is generally reserved for comments not related to the public hearings we have coming up later. Um, if anyone, we don't have any speakers cards tonight, but if anyone um, would like to speak uh, during this period, uh, now is the time. Okay, uh, seeing and hearing uh, no speakers, we will move on to reports of the commission. Uh, tonight we have three reports from the policy committee. Um, uh, Mr. Haldeman, do you want to start first? And then we'll sure. have some a report from the DRC. Thank you. Uh, the policy committee met uh, three times. Uh, the first on February 14th, uh, the meeting came to order at 4 p.m. Uh, Ms. M Ms. Rosario introduced the capital improvement program process. The commissioners agreed that the new spreadsheet and ranking mechanisms were easy to use. Various divisions submitted 24 capital program applications, of which four were for schools. The applications totaled $114.5 million, of which $14 million were for fiscal 2020. School applications amounted to $5,380 million for 2020 and $60 million four hundred and thirty thousand over the subsequent four years commissioners discussed rankings and criteria for the various projects there was a lengthy discussion on the school enrollment projections and cost methodology for the school projects the committee will meet again on february 21st to discuss ap uh, applications with representatives of the parks and recreation department and the fire department the committee will meet with representatives of the school division on february 28th the meeting was adjourned at 5.10 p.m. Uh, on February 21st, um, Mr. Ribeiro introduced the subject of a capital request of $8,910,000 for a new 14,000 square foot four bay fire station, which would be the county's sixth. Two more may follow. The request is for $1,410,000 for design and engineering in fiscal 2020 and $6,215,000 for construction in 2021, and $1,285,000 for furniture and fixtures in 2022. The design would be patterned after Station 4, with some modifications and allowance for future expansion, and the design cost may be somewhat lower when the exact location is determined. The ideal location is on Opportunity Way because... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, because the largest number of calls come from outside the six-minute response time required by policy and safety originate between stations one and four. This location will also eliminate the cost of land acquisition. The cost estimates do not include new equipment. Messrs. Ash and Aiken presented coverage maps and discussed the need for safer environment within the station, greater support for neighboring coverage areas, particularly stations one and four, and also including those in York County and Williamsburg. There was also a discussion of, equi of equipment use. There followed a discussion of the Parks and Rec Division's request for capital to cover the expense of 10 projects. The total estimated cost of these projects is $18,028,000, of which $2,053,000 fall in fiscal 2020. The Division's top 2020 priority is $1,720,000, to replace a 1970s era wooden bulkhead uh, at the marina uh, to replace and fix docks and gas tanks and to create a green shoreline. Requests for these projects made in fiscal 2018 and 19 were not funded. A second phase of marina improvement requests will come in later years, although the total cost could be re uh, reduced by doing both phases together. Messrs. Carnifax and Perkinson also discussed requests for the ongoing restoration and renovation of the Chickahominy River Park 
under the Shaping Our Shores Master Plan and a new park and swimming pool for the lower county. The meeting was adjourned at 4.45 p.m. And finally, the uh, uh, policy committee met on February 28th. The meeting came to order at 4 p.m. Uh, Mr. Uh, Marcelo Snipes introduced a capital request for four projects totaling 65,809,000 odd for increased school capacity, of which uh, 5,380,000 plus is planned for fiscal 2020. The costs excluded land acquisition, furniture and fixtures, and buses. The school division's first priority is $38.5 million for a new elementary school, with design and engineering costs of $3.5 million to be committed in fiscal 2020, and the balance committed for construction in 2021. Existing designs may be used depending upon current pedagogical requirements. The cost estimates were provided by the division's architect. The building would house 700 students and approximately 106,000 square feet. The cost, per, the cost per foot of construction is $330,000 compared to an average of $204, I'm sorry, $330 compared to an average of $204 for the 11 schools built in Virginia over the past two years. The school division CIP development committee supported moving this project up to from 2027 to 2020 based on enrollment trends and growth estimates. The division's nine elementary schools are currently at 98% capacity. The division has not yet identified a site for the school, which will require about 11 acres under the comp plan guidelines. The committees discussed with staff the idea of building separate facilities for preschool on three school sites. This idea was discussed on two levels by the school division, which found that it could cause transportation burdens. The projects, the other projects are to expand capacity of the three high schools as follows. Uh, Lafayette High School, 3,106,000 in later years. Warhill High School, uh, $890,000 in 2020 uh, and $12,235,000 uh, in later years. And Jamestown High School, 957000 uh, in 2020 and 11930000 in later years. The high school projects will add 12 classrooms and an auxiliary gym at Warhill, Warhill and eight classrooms each at Jamestown and Lafayette. <laughs> the meeting was adjourned at 4.50. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, for Mr. Alden? Um, we're moving on to um, Mr. Polster's report from this um, past month's uh, Development Review Committee meeting. Thank you. Development Review Committee met at 4 p.m. on February 20th, 2019. Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Schmidt, and I were present to review an appeal of a planning director's denial <clears throat> of a parking waiver request. It pertained to the two drummers site plan 18-0089 extra mile landscape and two drummers smokehouse expansion. The master plan for the project was approved by the Board of Supervisors in 2016. The applications are currently going through a site plan process with the county staff. The master plan indicates 110 parking spaces and the addition, uh, and the addition to the restaurant would double the seating to around 250 seats. This would equate to a minimum of 63 spaces and a maximum of 75 spaces and would not support 110 parking spaces based on County Ordinance Section 24-59, minimum off-street parking requirements for commercial use. The DRC heard from the applicant who did a traffic analysis of the existing parking conditions. He stated that during peak op operational hours, the restaurant is currently filling the existing parking lot and the overflow is parking uh, in next door in the extra mile landscape parking lot. He added that the current parking formula does not account for the 10 to 15 employees who also require parking spaces. The applicant also showed and provided comments on the proposed site plan indicating the proposed parking space layout and stormwater mitigation plan given the location of the parking space to the 100-foot RPA buffer. Approval of the parking waiver request at this time would allow all parking improvements to be completed at the same time as the restaurant expansion without the need for phasing the parking lot construction. By a vote of 3-0, to zero, the DRC approved the parking waiver request to go above the 120 percent uh, maximum parking cap. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polster. Um, any questions for Mr. Polster? All right, and we'll see that again in a moment with our 
uh, consent agenda, which we'll move on to that item of our meeting now. Um, with our consent agenda, items are typically deemed to be non-controversial. However, if a commissioner would like to pull an item for further discussion, we can do that. Uh, we have two items on the consent agenda tonight, the minutes from the February 6th uh, meeting, our last me uh, Planning Commission meeting, and we have the uh, DRC action item that uh, Mr. Polster just spoke about, uh, SP-18-89. Um, is any, would anyone like to uh, pull an item? Motion to approve the consent agenda, Mr. Chair. Oh, we have a motion on the floor, and this is just a voice vote. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone not in favor? All right. So we're going to go into our public hearings now. Um, and our first public hearing is an SUP-19-4. Uh, uh, Ms. Costello, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Mr. Mike Nat Gaffney of Rummel, Klepper, and Kahl have applied on behalf of the James City Service Authority for a special use permit to allow for the installation of approximately 1,100 linear feet of a 14-inch water main. The proposed water main will be located under College Creek along the south side of Hummelson Parkway eastbound bridge. The project is within VDOT's right-of-way, which is zoned R5, multifamily residential, R8, rural residential, and R1, limited residential. The property is designated low-density residential on the comprehensive plan land use map and is located inside the primary service area. The current water main is located along the north side of Hummelson Parkway West Brown Bridge and is, in, and is in need of major repair and rehabilitation. This water main was installed in 1976 when water lines were a permitted use in accordance with the issuance of a conditional use permit. However, staff was unable to locate this permit in county records. The proposed water main will handle a larger capacity of water than what is currently in use, therefore it would not be considered a maintenance project. The current ordinance also requires a special use permit for water lines that are located outside a subdivision or other approved development. Simultaneously, the county will also be co-locating a fiber optic cable, which will enhance the county's communication system, as well as serve the Williamsburg James City County School Division. Staff finds the proposal to be compatible with the comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance, and surrounding development and recommends that the Planning Commission recommend approval of this application subject to the proposed conditions. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and the applicant and the James City Service Authority are also available. Thank you. So do we have any questions for staff? I had a, um, one question. Um, it might be for the uh, for RK and K, but I was trying to get a sense, when I look at the master plan um, schematic uh, in roughly in the area where the pipe goes in and comes out, I guess, on both sides of College Creek, um, there's this reference to like some type of box structure. I was wondering kind of a s scale of that or if that's even visible well, they're gonna, or is on that the, below? On the entrance side, oh. they're going to have like a staging area with the equipment yep. and they'll be drilling it. And then on the exit side, it'll just be where the where the drill comes out, and then they'll be pulling the pipe through along with the fiber optic cable. This is not like a three dimensional uh, above ground box or so, anything. Not that I'm aware of, but I can defer to the okay. applicant. Um, and the other in that same area where it comes out, so on the uh, east side of the creek, where the um, some uh, vegetation needs to be cleared. Um, I was wondering, is that is that more just so that there's access to get the pipe to have space to work where the pipe comes out, or, or is that also just for storing equipment? Because I did the reason why I asked that is because there is a little pull-off area there, which is not a county property, um, but for that the College Creek Estates area, where I thought maybe not as much vegetation would need to be cleared if some vehicles could uh, be parked there. I think there's some storage of equipment that's going to be there on a okay. temporary basis, not on a permanent basis, but I can defer to them okay. as well. 
see from the aerial, some of that is within VDOT right away. So you're right, they wouldn't want to pull up onto private property without permission or right. some type of contractual agreement. But there's there's a little bit of room to pull up there and not be. Right, and I guess what I'm getting at is if there was a way to have, you know, not clear as much vegetation if vehicles could be parked. I know it's not VDOT right away, but if there could be something worked out with the uh, property owner who might, you know, might be in their best interest to not have as much vegetation cleared if, if there was I think a the goal is to keep it all in VDOT's right of way as much as possible and not have to go across property lines. Yeah. Maybe the applicant could give us a little bit of insight about how many um, staging vehicles or work vehicles they would expect on the site at any given time that may by any concern. So, um, good evening. My name is Mike Gaffney. I'm a Municipal engineer with the, the engineering firm of RKK and Newport News. We're doing a design for the service authority. The construction operation on the western side of of the creek includes uh, the drill rig, uh, some mud mixing equipment and recovery equipment, and then any equipment that's necessary to move those things around, a uh, small backhoe perhaps. Uh, on the eastern side of the of the creek is the pipe stringing area where the pipe is laid out and welded together and you can see that in I think it's shown in, in blue on your uh, exhibit and that'll be behind a uh, Jersey barrier temporary Jersey barrier um, to protect the traveling public there will be construction entrances and there will be some equipment um, to move pipe around uh, to get ready for the pullback part of the operation the operation has uh, four real main parts First is uh, to make the hole, and that is to drill under the creek about 1,100 feet. Then it is to ream the hole to a diameter that's appropriate for pulling the pipe back. And during that, those initial operations, they are at the same time assembling the pipe, welding it all together. When those three operations are done, they connect the pipe and they, they pull it back. And on this one, they're going to connect a couple of conduits for your, um, for your communication lines as well. That will later get the get your uh, fiber optic system uh, connected. Uh, one thing we can do is require them to limit the number of personal vehicles that could be there, and then you know they can bring people in and out. Um, the crews aren't aren't huge, but that is an, an idea I'm thinking of. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not I'm not concerned about the number of vehicles. I think more so I was just interested in limiting the amount of vegetation that would be cleared um just i know understand that it sounds like or looking at the purple line it looks like most is within the vdot right away but just for the and i do live in kings point but not near that spot um kings point and college creek estates just the more you know the more vegetation the more sort of sound buffer they get it's not necessarily a visual thing but sound buffer with the traffic That's i think we all. we've tried to uh restrict the um, clearing area on our, on our plans and, and can continue to do so. I will note that uh, it's a developed area. It's been cleared in the past. The yeah. trees are, we're not dealing with mature, you know, right, huge the pine, mature pines trees mostly, I think, right Small there. diameter pine trees yep. in that location, both, both sides. And then the, to the, that earlier question for staff, is there, there's, once it's all said and done, there's no, nothing above ground. I mean, it's all just the pipes down below. There's no, the only Access above ground is already there, and it's a hydrant. Yep, yep. All right, that that answers all my all my questions. And I, ironically, I sort of set this whole thing in motion because a buddy of mine was on a paddle board and called me and said, "There's a leaking pipe under 199." So I called <laughs> James City County Service Authority and called this in. So yeah, it's mission critical infrastructure for the yeah. for the service authority and the folks, the folks that live on that side of the bridge. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, with that, we will open the public hearing, and I don't believe we have any speakers' cards. Um, if anyone from the audience would like to step forward uh, on this uh, public hearing, now is the time. Okay, seeing and hearing. Oh, one more thing. Um, are there any disclosures among – this would be – probably not, but <laughs> among uh, fellow commissioners. Okay, so seeing and hearing, um, no speakers. We will close the public hearing and open it to discussion among the commission.
I just wanted to say that I thought that the environmental impact uh, study that was done in the archaeological piece was just absolutely amazing to me, the level of detail. I don't think I've ever seen anything so thorough. Compliments to that work. No other discussion? Um, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move approval of SUP 19-0004 uh, with the uh, draft conditions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor. Thank you. Ms. Dowdy. Yes. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Krupp. Aye. And Mr. Schmidt. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, um, now we move on to our next public hearing, um, which is uh, an AFD slash uh, zero two slash eight six slash two slash uh, uh, 2018. Uh, Ms. Sula, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Mr. Jonathan Kinney has applied to add a 14.1 acre parcel to the Croker AFD. The parcel is located at 4450 Ware Creek Road is zoned A1 and is designated LDR by the comprehensive plan. The land is currently under the care of a professional forester and meets proximity requirements for inclusion into the AFD. Approval of this application would bring the total district to approximately 1,197.3 acres. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend inclusion of this parcel into the Croker AFD to the Board of Supervisors, subject to the conditions adopted during the renewal of the Croker AFD earlier this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Sula. Any questions for staff? Thank you. So with that, we open the public hearing. Again, I don't believe we have any speaker cards. Um, would anyone like to step forward? Okay, seeing and hearing no one, we will close. Oh, do we have any disclosures? <laughs> no disclosures. <laughs> Um, we will go ahead and close the public hearing and open up for a discussion among the commissioners. As you all probably saw, the notes that uh, I sent off to staff uh, on on this specific one and, and other is that I'm puzzled as to how we're rationalizing the inclusion of some of these properties within the AFD based on soil or uh, it's in the comp plan culture. And I recognize that uh, there is no specific number of, of these factors that go into uh, determining whether it should be included or not. It bothers me that uh, when I looked at the uh, minutes from the January FD meeting, and went through uh, this and several others, uh, what I was looking for, which is what they're charged for to state code, is the uh, expert advice to the nature of farming and forestry and agricultural and forestall products that would, in fact, shed some light on those seven factors uh, that's in the code uh, for them. Now, what I found interesting about this one uh, was that the Applicant and owner of this property has three other properties in the Barnes Swamp area. And I remember taking a look at um, that application, at least for one of them. And what struck me, which is the same thing that I wish I would have seen a little bit more within the staff notes or at least from the AFT, is the comment in there about a professional forester. And if you uh, had a chance to... Uh, take a look at that uh, forester. He um, actually manages several properties throughout the county. He's under contract to the owner uh, and has, I don't know, something like 3,200 acres of land that he's helped process and brokered to uh, product harvesting of this thing. And so what I was looking for was some rationale from the AFD that did a little bit more to, in fact, say, hey, if you look at the seven pieces that are here, does it meet any of the seven besides the comp plan 
the agriculture and the soil. Now, no offense, but you know when you look at any of these properties, there's lots of different soils and different uh, pieces that go along with it that are impacted by slope, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't have a problem, and I would support this one because I think it does meet number one and number two in terms of its significance and the product that it comes out with. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking at uh, these uh, items that we're going to this evening. Thank you, Mr. Post. Anyone else? All right. I'm to make a motion. Make a motion that we approve AFD 180016. I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. 0286. 0286. AFD 02 86 2 2018 4450 Ware Creek Road for the Croker AFD edition. Is that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And to recommend approval on the floor. Ms. Dowdy. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Krupp. Aye. And Mr. Schmidt. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to our next hearing, which is another AFD, AFD 18 0016. And this is 365, 358, and 382 Ivy Hill Road, Milk Creek AFD edition. Ms. Suloff. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Mr. Johnson has applied to enroll the parcels located at 365, 358, and 382 Ivy Hill Road, which total approximately 60.73 acres into the Mill Creek AFD. The parcels are zoned A1, general agricultural, and are designated rural lands on the county's comprehensive plan. Staff finds the property meets applicable criteria for inclusion, including proximity requirements. Approval of this application would bring the total district to approximately 3,224 acres. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend inclusion of this parcel into the Mill Creek AFD to the Board of Supervisors, subject to the conditions adopted during the renewal of the Mill Creek AFD earlier this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Is there anybody from the AFD here? Is there anybody here from the Department of Revenue's office? No, not, not tonight. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, and I'll ask at this time, are there any disclosures among the commissioners? Okay, no disclosures. So we'll go ahead and we will open the public hearing. And again, no speaker cards. Um, do we have anyone who would like to speak on this public hearing? Seeing and hearing no one, we will go ahead. Oh, Mr. Chairman, yes. just I meant to, for the disclosure, just state for the record that um, our my house and property is within this AFD, but there's no conflict of interest or anything that would preclude my ability to vote on that. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Crop. Um, so we have no no speakers, and we will go ahead and close the public hearing and open up for discussion. I, uh, in that note that I sent everybody to the staff and got an answer from staff on that, I was concerned about 382, and specifically the amount of land uh, that is in the RPA as well as the steep slopes on that. I understand that uh, with the agriculture and forest all that there is uh, an allowance to uh, in fact I think by 50 feet go into the RPA buffer uh, but on the other hand uh, it has to be restored etc for that thing so I, I think I, I get that uh, I am a little concerned about the sloping on that that specific piece um, but what I was hoping that there would be somebody here from the Revenue Office is that at some point after this is approved uh, there'll be a determination by the uh, revenue folks uh, of um, the Commissioner of Revenue as to the uh, tax uh, for the land. And so my question for him, and I don't know that staff can, can say that, uh, answer that, is does the land in the RPA qualify for a tax break? So, you know, I raise these issues uh, with one of the other properties. It's entirely in the RPA that was approved. It's marshland and water uh, for it, and it is not a um, sporadic uh, creek piece. It's year-round. And so I don't know what we're trying to do with uh, protecting and having stuff uh, in the AFD that's already protected. I brought that point up, I guess, about a year ago. 
So I, I have a concern about, well, once again, all I know is that the expert advice that we got was the staff report, which is the soil, the comp plan, and the agriculture. And there was nothing else to rationalize of any of the other seven significant factors that they supposedly can consider. So uh, based on that, I will not support this. Thank you, Mr. Poster. Um, any other discussion? I just, I'm just nosing around on the county's website and um, and some other resources in Virginia for AFDs. And you know, I think Mr. Polster's point, the way the way I look at it is, although property has RPA and is arguably non-developable, part of the advantage of the AFD is that the whole parcel goes in and becomes non-developable, you know, while this AFD district is in effect. Um, I'm just reading from the county's website, it's the policy of the Commonwealth to conserve and protect ag and forestal lands as valued natural, re valued natural and ecological resources, which provide essential open spaces for clean air sheds, watershed protection, wildlife habitat, as well as the aesthetic purposes. So I think those are some of the pieces, while it doesn't go in there, would allow us to consider RPA as part of an ag and forestal district. So. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Holland? Um, th this is a question, or I guess a rhetorical question. I really don't expect an answer. But I would think that the purpose of the AFD is to reduce the property assessment while it's in the AFD. And I would think that that reduction would already have occurred for property that's in an RPA and is non-developable. Uh, just to think a non-developable property would have a lower assessment just by virtue well, that's of That's why I wanted to hear because the, yeah. the process is a mystery for me in terms of how the Commissioner of uh, Revenue uh, makes that determination. So, for example, uh, the case that we saw for the HRSD with the uh, Colonial Williamsburg slash uh, Carter's Grove, none of that plan had any tax uh, make on it. Zero. So I, I'm just curious as to how we're going about it, especially when you looked at that piece of property with all severe slopes, the amount of RPA, et cetera. And if that's the case, I'm good with that. But I don't know. Oh. All interesting points, good discussion. I think it, I'm suspecting this will carry over into our discussions throughout the year on uh, revisiting the comp plan, et cetera. So, Mr. Well, Chairman, so. I'm, I'm not sure I've got a, a rhetorical answer back oh, to sorry, Mr. Holman's Mr. rhetorical Holman's question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but again, it, you know, I think what we have seen from as staff over the years, I don't think it's been our experience necessarily that everybody has applied to be a part of an AFD for the then possibility of a resulting um, re reduction on taxes due. I think as Mr. O'Connor stated, the purposes of the AFD program as stated by the Commonwealth are very broad. Um, and we have had interactions with AFD property owners in the past who um, have not had an interest necessarily in having taxes reduced to be that they are um, seeking some protections from development pressures when these properties go into the AFD. The properties can only be developed per those conditions that the board has put on the district. So there is a lot of <clears throat> protection against development pressures through that for the, for the term that the property is in the AFD district. And we've run across some property owners who have um, been interested in this for those uh, intangibles. Um, with just the property preservation and, and um, looking for some of those broader reasons, which is why they want to. the stewardship of the land, I guess, would be the best sort of categorical description that I would say. Um, so there, I think there are multiple benefits. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, that there, it boils down to necessarily just that one. I'm pleased to have been corrected. That's from, from that's my great. experience. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, Mr. Chairman, I move we approve um, AFD 18-0016 for 
365, 358, and 382, Ivy Hill Road, Mill Creek, AFD edition. Great, thank you. We have a motion for approval on the floor. For Correct, for AFD. 18-0016, thank you, thank you. Got transposed there. Uh, Ms. Dowdy. Aye. Mr. Polster. No. Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Kropp. Aye. And Mr. Schmidt. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, moving on to our next AFD. Uh, AFD-18-1798-88, Sycamore Landing Road, Croker, AFD edition. Ms. Suloff, welcome again. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Mrs. Kelly Fulton has applied on behalf and with the permission of Mr. Thomas Dana to add 62.35 acres of land to the Croker AFD district. The land is located at 9888 Sycamore Landing Road, is zoned A1, and is designated rural lands by the comprehensive plan. While the land is outside of the mile radius from the core of the district, state code permits parcels to be added upon finding that the property contains agriculturally and forestally significant land. The Board of Supervisors approved a similar case for addition um, to the Croker AFD on an adjacent parcel in 2017, and that case was AFD 2-86-1-2017-9730 Sycamore Landing Road. Uh, the USDA soil survey indicates that the site is home to soils which have moderately high potential for both crops and timbering. State code indicates that one such factor for the consideration of the addition of property uh, outside of the one mile radius is the presence of suitable soils for the site. At its January 24th meeting, the AFD advisory committee unanimously found that the land in question contains agriculturally and forestally significant land and voted to include the parcel in the district. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend inclusion of this parcel into the Kroger AFD to the Board of Supervisors, subject to the conditions adopted during the renewal of the Kroger AFD earlier this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, any questions for staff? Thank you, Ms. Sula. Um, and do we have any disclosures among the commissioners? Okay. All right. With that, we will open the public hearing. And I think once again, we do not have any speaker cards. Would anyone from the audience like to step forward? All right, seeing and hearing um, no one, we will close the public hearing and we will open it for discussion among the commissioners. Most I've got the uh, same concerns that I've expressed already. And, and I guess the reason that I've come to this is that I've just seen at least uh, two, if not a third one, uh, conceptual plans where uh, properties were moved out of the AFD and they've been developed uh, for. And so I, I certainly do understand uh, that if somebody wants to protect that land, and we do have pieces of property within the AFD that are also within the PDR. So there are multiple ways if people want to preserve that. I'm just not so sure that the criteria that we have here, we ought to at least expect something coming from the side staff to be able to rationalize that for whatever it is. There's no evidence. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, um, I will be supporting this application. I feel, uh, as was mentioned in the last case, my personal preference is to use a broad brush on initiatives, uh, you know, this is sort of a toolbox approach. The AFD is one tool to preserve uh, open space, wooded area, agricultural lands. Uh, there certainly are other tools out there as well. Um, in the past, we've had purchase of development rights and, and so on and so forth. But I, I tend to, to take a broader look at, at this using the overarching, as Mr. O'Connor brought up, the overarching principles that um, the Virginia Commonwealth has established saying that um, they are supportive of measures uh, to preserve uh, and protect uh, agricultural and, and wooded land. So I'll be supporting this particular application. Thank you. Any further discussion? Um, if not, may I have a motion? Motion to approve AFD-18-0017-9888, Sycamore Landing Road, uh, with the associated SUP conditions previously uh, mentioned. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Holt, we have a motion on the floor for AFD-18-0017-9888. 
0017. Ms. Dowdy? Aye. Mr. Polster? No. Mr. Haldeman? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. Mr. Croft? Aye. And Mr. Schmidt? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to our next AFD, uh, we have AFD slash 1800194928 Fenton Mill Road Croker AFD edition, Ms. Suloff. Thank you again, Mr. Uh, Chairman, members of the Commission. Mr. Charles Apperson and Ms. Patricia Russo have applied to enroll a 52-acre parcel in the Croker AFD. The parcel is located at 4928 Fenton Mill Road, is zoned A1 General Agricultural, and is designated rural lands by the Comprehensive Plan. Staff believes this parcel was not included in the AFD after the 1996 renewal of the district due to an administrative error. The parcel has remained active in the agricultural and forestal activities in conjunction with neighboring parcels since that time. Staff finds that the property meets applicable cr criteria for inclusion, including proximity re requirements. Approval of this application would bring the total district to approximately 1,234 acres. At its January 24th meeting, the AFD Advisory Committee unanimously voted to inc recommend inclusion of this parcel into the district. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend inclusion of this parcel into the Croker AFD to the Board of Supervisors subject to the conditions adopted during the renewal of the Croker AFD earlier this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, do you have any questions for staff? Thank you so much. We will open the public hearing. Again, no speaker cards. Do we have anyone who would like to speak on this public hearing? All right, um, and do we have any disclosures among commissioners? Okay, so we will go ahead and we will close the public hearing and open it up for discussion among the commission. I'll raise the same issues that I had within the note that I sent. This is one that, that once again, that, that I will support. And so what's interesting about this is that uh, factor number two talks about the significance in adjacent areas. And so when you take a look at the Appersons, they actually have two adjacent properties that they own. And it looks to me that when I go back and take a look at this thing, they've been actually uh, working this for 1996 when they bought the property in 95. And, and what's interesting is that when you take a look at the, uh, the maps for that, the adjacent property actually has some new plantings that extend into this new area. And so there isn't any doubt in my mind when I look at that of what they're trying to protect as well as how they're trying to make a living off of forestry products. Okay? And that's the type of evidence that I'm looking for as opposed to broad brush it makes that as opposed to something more specific. And once again, I come back to when I look at the minutes of the AFD that's supposed to give us expert advice why didn't they tell us about that? Why didn't they at least let us know and give us the grounds so that we can say, hey, point this and say yes? Yeah, that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Polster. No further discussion? I just, I actually think the conversation is beneficial, especially in light of uh, the HRSD application we had last month. And, um, you know, and, it, and it's interesting, but I, Again, just been poking around, and I'm on the Virginia Farm Bureau website, and and I think I think the the broad brushed application that that we talk about here um, is summed up pretty well here. Um, it talks about how property owners can it's a mutual undertaking with local government. By establishing a district, property owners agree not to convert their farm, forest land, or other open space lands to more intense commercial, industrial, or residential uses for a term of four to ten years. In return, the county and commonwealth agree not to take actions or make infrastructure investments that will place increased pressure on landowners to convert land in the district to more intense land uses. So, you know, this... I think that's sort of the, the broad brushed approach that the county has taken over the years to say, you know, this is a tool from the comp plan um, not to encourage development of that area. And it, my perspective, it puts those into these districts that require yet again another action from the legislative to remove it from the district if there's ever an opportunity to develop it. So. I take your point. 
I really do, because uh, when I looked at the minutes of the 202 of the Carter Grove area, which was Colonial Williamsburg at the time, is there was, uh, in the minutes, testimony from the DCR and from the Forestry Department from the state of Virginia supporting that project. We don't see any of that except for soil. And so all I'm saying is, hey, we used to rationalize why these things were done, not just some broad brush sort of an idea, and especially when you start talking about any of the tax implications to this thing. My two cents. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to make a motion that we approve JCC AFD uh, 18-0019-4928 Fenton Mill Road in the Croker, as a Croker edition. Um, with the attached um, conditions. All right, we have a motion on the floor, Mr. Holt. Ms. Dowdy. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Kropp. Aye. And Mr. Schmidt. Aye. Thank you, Motion Carries. All right, to our final public hearing of the evening, uh, another AFD, AFD-18-0020-83-2019-4928 uh, Diascon Road, Mill Creek AFD edition, Ms. Sula. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Mr. John Sim has also applied to enroll the entire 10 acres of his parcel lo located at 8328 Diascon Road in the Mill Creek AFD. The parcel is zoned A1, General Agricultural, and is designated rural lands on the county's comprehensive plan. Staff finds that the property meets applicable criteria for inclusion, including proximity requirements. An approval of this application would bring the total district to approximately 3,224 acres. At its January 24th meeting, the AFD Advisory Committee unanimously found um, that the land in question does contain agriculturally and forcefully significant land and voted to include the parcel in the district. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend approval and inclusion of this parcel into the Mill Creek AFD to the Board of Supervisors subject to the conditions adopted during the renewal of the Mill Creek AFD earlier this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sula. Do we have any questions for staff? Thank you. Um, and disclosures, Mr. Kropp, I guess. Uh, as, as stated previously, I, my house is in the Mill Creek AFD, but I don't uh, have a conflict of interest. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and with that, we'll open the public hearing and no speaker cards. Do we have anyone who would like to speak? Okay, um, seeing and hearing no one, we will go ahead and we will close the public hearing and open up for discussion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve um, AFD-18-0020 Mill Creek 8328 Dyson Road edition. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Mr. Holt, we have a motion on the floor. Ms. Dowdy. Aye. Mr. Polster. No. Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Kropp. Aye. And Mr. Schmidt. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Ms. Sula. All right. Moving to our planning, planning commission considerations. Um, Tonight on our agenda, we have the Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals 2018 Annual Report. Um, and uh, I guess we have to do a, a voice vote on uh, yeah, anyone just, wants I'll, to discuss. I'll anything. kick it off once yeah. again, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. And another year has flown by, and here we are. It seems like just yesterday we were talking about the 2017 Annual Report. So as we've done, this, the format of your annual report uh, follows previous years. There's an executive summary on the front that's um, uh, submitted by Heath Richardson. Um, you'll see the summary there. The table of contents that follows, um, again, mimics previous years. We note the population increase that has happened. Um, the, the population growth, the number of dwelling units that's been added from the last calendar year, and the subdivision build out. Um, I think most importantly, the annual report does a good job about summarizing the large cases that the Planning Commission has considered uh, during the calendar year. But I think the, one of the most interesting things of the report, um, this year we've moved it to the end, 
that's a roll-up summary of all of the efforts that have been undertaken by all of the various county departments uh, in furtherance of implementing the comprehensive plan. Certainly wish that there were more resources to kind of get it all done. That's a little intimidating to think about anyway. We've got over 400 goal strategies and action items in the adopted comprehensive um, but I think, uh, again, this year's annual report shows that some significant progress has been made and, and some heavy lifting has been done. If nothing else, certainly looking at the work that the Planning Commission has done in moving some policies from the past into the ordinances this past year. Um, so with that, I'd be more than happy to help answer any questions. I think about two years ago, you and I got into a discussion about the number of permits, uh, and they were increasing coming out of the uh, 208 recession piece. And I was very supportive of increasing staff uh, to help you to be able to process this, as well as the automation piece that we put in place with the permalink. How, how is that working out for you as you look back over this last year? Um, so it's it's been great. Uh, anytime you have a major paradigm shift on how you're processing things. It takes some time to adjust. Um, I think earlier in the year, it was took everybody a little bit of time to get adjusted to the new system, but it seems like each week has gone better than the previous. Um, I certainly think as time continues, we will continue to see a lot of efficiency um, output from those investments. I certainly think some of the initial reaction has been very favorable on the, the builder side they can get immediate results from their inspections everything's posted in real time um, and there's not a need at all to have to come down to the county to submit permit documents pay fees do everything online now our lobby traffic has dropped way significantly down phone traffic has picked up while we're helping folks navigate the new system um, but I think in time, as that familiarity gets, uh, so, so you know, I think, I think there's there's always process improvements. We have a long list of process improvements we we like to do and that we've already identified. But I think we're going to really start to reap the benefits of that, both in terms of productivity. But to your point, uh, as we hit June 11th of 2019, that'll be our one-year anniversary. We're going to start to have access to a lot more information than we did in years. Thank you. And all of that information will be in real time. So it'll be really nice to be able to kind of get into that. Just a um, minor observation. I, I don't know. Uh, looking at the percent annual population increase between two, 2008 and 2018, uh, for the most part, every year the population increase has been pretty steadily between, say, one and a half one and a quarter and two and a quarter. So it's a relatively flat, except for 2010, when it was 5.4%. And I was wondering, was there, you know, was it the fact that the recession had ended um, and maybe there were more um, purchases of property? Was there, was there a major development that came online that um, provided additional housing? Was there anything that could, you, you could attribute that to or just one of those permutations in the, in the graph? Um, it's probably more of a paper number than real population. Remember on the decennial, every census every 10 years, they mm -hmm. do the actual counts, right? Right. And so in 2010, when they went through and did the actual count, so that spike is really going to account for sort of a resetting or recalibration mm -hmm. because on the, the, e the, the single-digit years, we only do estimates. So really that 5.4% sort of, takes that where we thought in 08 and 09, we only had uh, population estimates, uh, growth of about 1.87 to 1. Point. Um, the actual number came in higher. We were underestimating a little bit. Um, I would imagine here as part of this census 2020, we're going to have another reset mm -hmm. and a calibration to where, where we are thinking the growth is, probably is in actuality maybe coming in a little bit higher um, and so when we hit that year from 2019 to whatever the actual real count is in 2020, we're going to need to match those numbers up, and that's where that spike will come from. So I think as far as this paper goes, it's more of an actual uh, um, paperwork exercise. I do think that the work that planning staff does 
when we go in and we actually look at the number of permits, the number of certificates of occupancy, the number of demolition permits, the number of units that are online, um, our, our, our uh, checking in with the uh, CCRCs as to the number of folks that they have there in their population, you know, I think we've got a really good sense about what those population estimates are in the top, top chart. We feel real good about those. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's all right with their photographs in the report. <laughs> That's right. This is the time. If you want to, if you want to reshoot, we're happy to accommodate. I want a copy so I can send it to my mother. <laughs> got it. And so, like I say, it's, it's tonight's really just a, a voice vote accepting the report for the year. It's not anything you have to adopt or anything. It is just an annual report. Um, what happens after this will will roll a copy up to the Board of Supervisors as part of their reading file. Just for me, being new to the Planning Commission, it was a great insight into what to expect for this year. It was a lot. <laughs> but very easy to read, very you know, lots of great information. Thank you. Yeah, that's fun to just being a history buff to sort of see the history of us, um, mm -hmm. you know, condensed in this report. Um, all right. Well, with that, I guess um, I all in favor of uh, adopting the report for 2018. Well, go ahead. Aye. 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 Um, and uh, that's that's that. That's all we need. All right. <laughs> that's right. Nothing so, too fancy. Okay, so moving on to uh, the planning director's report, and over to you again, Mr. Holt. Thank you very much again, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Good evening. Um, nothing specific or special to add in terms of the cover pieces, but again, another whole year has passed. Um, I slipped in an, an attachment to this that you all get once a year. So we have as your third attachment there the draft proposed calendar for the Planning Commission for 2019 and 2020. Um, don't have to vote on this tonight. Again, recessing from here tonight, your next meeting will be on the 18th, just in a couple of weeks. That's on a Monday. Make sure you've got that on your schedule because it doesn't fit our normal pattern. 6 p.m. Start, the start time is 6 p.m. Um, that'll be your or annual organizational meeting, and at that meeting you will um, elect new officers, chair and vice chair, and you'll also adopt your calendar. So take this home, take a look at it. If there's anything that doesn't look right, seem right, sound right, or by consensus you all want changed, please let me know so that when we prepare that agenda packet, we can have the updated most correct version in it that you all then can vote on. Um, let me point to two or three things in this just because it doesn't fit the normal, typical pattern of our normal. Um, for the Planning Commission for 2019, um, we're going to propose moving the joint work session with the Board of Supervisors from our traditional timeline in May to June. There have been some email traffic um, and, and some polling of that. The work session of the Board last week staff had started to talk with the board about comp plan methodology, the survey, the timeline, all of those. Um, the, the board expressed a very strong desire to continue to work in partnership with the Planning Commission throughout this whole process. And ultimately, that's going to be uh, obviously a really, really good thing. Um, June 25th is when we are scheduled to go back to the board to present the results of that citizen survey that's getting ready to kick off here. And so I think by sliding that joint session joint work session back to be concurrent, Planning Commission can benefit from those results as well. Um, I think it would be a really good fit. Um, informally, there were six folks who were available in May for that work session and six of you that were available in, in June, so it, it seemed to be a tie vote there, but that's the proposal there. The Moving into 2020, still at the top column there on the left, that January 8th meeting, that's going to be the second Wednesday of the month. First when, The way the calendar falls, the first Wednesday is um, January 1st. You can have a New Year's Day planning commission if you want. Um, Old ball games. So. Got something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we put it there for the 8th, just um, for the consistency of keeping it on the Wednesday. Um, so let us know. 
Then really the only other thing that doesn't fit the typical pattern with the policy committee and DRC, that March 27th DRC um, is a week later, and that's just because we have to give notice for when that meeting is from when you adopt the calendar. So um, have our organizational meeting on Monday and then have a DRC on that Wednesday. So we've had that back week. Everything else you should see there, policy committee-wise, DRC, should fit your typical pattern um, for all year, but certainly would be interested in hearing if there are any changes. And staff would be very interested uh, between now and the 18th to see if the Planning Commission has any consensus um, on start time of the meetings. We had a conversation about a year ago if there would be any interest. Start time is currently at 6. The board this year at their organizational meeting reaffirmed having a start time at 5. When we polled all the other boards and commissions last year as part of this inquiry, um, um, planning commission is one of the few sort of left that starts at six. Um, certainly, want to make it easy and transparent, and um, have a start time that gets the most public input possible. Um, so, to some degree, there's something to be said for consistency uh, with start times and meetings to avoid any of that confusion. But I can open that up for. Not discussion tonight, but just open that up for, to let staff know what you want to do between. Questions about the report? Are we just talking calendar or report in general? Um, um, we can go. We can do calendar and discussion. <laughs> no, I, no, just I appreciate the memo that you included. Just curious sort of next steps on workforce housing task force and all that <clears throat> will we get a preview or will it just become part of the comp plan review kind of how does that all get incorporated I guess our actions over the next six months or a year sure um, a, a little bit of everything but I don't Put have Mr. a lot Mr. Haldeman on the spot if you want um, uh, yeah, we the uh, the work is done. Uh, the report is written. The draft report is written. Um, I'm not aware that it was coming to the planning commission. Is it? Yeah, I didn't think so. I just um, meant, but as a tool, not not necessarily for an approving piece, but just curious to see. I think the next step will be to ask the board of supervisors to accept it, and um, it'll be on the website county website along with the housing condition study um, and uh, it's about 32 pages a lot of work um, a, a lot of work a lot of real good information I'm not sure we've got a discrete next um, decision point with the board on the report itself the task force did conclude its meetings and voted on the report uh, to finalize that at its last meeting and with that um, it, it was it was bittersweet. Uh, it was just such a good group of folks. They'd been together and been working hard for 14 months. They had their first meeting way back in December of 17, and just so much good information had, had come out of this effort. Um, we last left it with the task force members in terms of implementation. There are a couple of known steps, and there are a couple of still working on to be decided steps. Um, there are some short-term grant funding opportunities with funding coming down the line this calendar year with the state and feds that would very directly get to some of the rehabilitation of some of the single existing single-family homes that are on the ground. Um, we did make a commitment to the task force that staff would be pursuing those because that directly met, met those goals. Um, and I think we have got a, a as a matter of fact, uh, staff has an item on the March 12th board meeting for consideration of, of having staff being able to apply for some very substantial community development block grant funding, not for any particular neighborhood, but would give the flexibility to staff to look countywide to start to get at some of those um, uh, homes that are in substantial need of rehab. So that'll be a good resource. So while the work of the citizen task force has concluded, there is a staff-oriented group that has fed and back-supported 
the citizen group this whole time. That group is going to reconstitute itself. We're going to add some folks from finance and some other uh, folks may rotate off, but their work is going to continue. Their, uh, Rebecca Vinroot, the Director of Social Services, and myself have charged this group of, of staff folks to take a look at each of the recommendations and to come up with their best thinking about what the resources it would take to put those into place. And then really the next step for Rebecca and myself would be to sit down with administration and find an opportunity to find the appropriate uh, venue for us to, you know, whether it's part of a next budget session uh, season or whether it's part of a separate work session effort to present those options to the board. You know, all along the recommendations of the task force and I think the structure of the task force was really designed to mimic that strategic plan process that the county went through. There were a lot of really, really good recommendations that came out of that. Each one of those recommendations is going to require some resource to do. Maybe a, a few that are low-hanging fruit with, that could be done with existing resources. Most will take new resources. And so I think having um, a more informed picture, a more informed um, quantitative list about what that would mean to go off and do that would be the appropriate next step for the board to then be able to make those decisions and in the context of, like I say, whether it be part of a future budget or part of a future work session. Um, so our next step internally as staff is, is to come up with that deliverable and to pursue that. And I think beyond that, yes, every bit, I think there are uh, uh, some interested folks on the task force who want to continue their involvement, continue their participation, continue their commitment uh, to this subject and and want to help find a way to incorporate some of those recommendations into the larger comprehensive plan content. Certainly recommendations for new development, you know, whether it be mixed use, mixed income, uh, implications for density, um, desires to be part of a transit hub at major intersections, you can really start to see the linkages with the land use map and what that would mean with the comprehensive plan. So, I think that's a, a very important next step uh, in the realization of, of some of those recommendations. Thanks. Thanks for serving on that. Well, happy to do it. I think it's really important to what we do here and some of these applications that have been coming in. So I appreciate the efforts of all the all the folks on that task force. That's all I have. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Holt. So. Moving on to um, planning commission discussion and requests, um, would any does anyone have something to add? Yeah, I Mr. wanted to uh, thank my uh, fellow members for the very collegial conversation that we had on the AFD issues and trying to understand the different points of uh, view. I, I'm very, very much uh, interested in this issue as we go through the comp plan. And if I understand it correctly, the um, uh, Board of Supervisors are going to be hearing something from staff on the AFD, PDR, and green space uh, soon, I understand. And so, I, you know, I am very interested to hear what that guidance is going to be in that direction and how it impacts uh, that tool set that we're talking about. Uh, especially uh, as Mr. Kraft and I have talked about is when we take a look at our current uh, comp plan and you look at our rural land policy, there's only one item in there that's enforceable with an ordinance, and all the rest isn't. And I think it, we ought to have something a little bit more specific than a broad brush to be able to get out there and protect that. Why the conversation was so helpful. Really good point. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just think it's probably, given what um, Mr. Holt just said, perhaps it's um, a good time to kick off the discussion on our our meeting um, start time. And I, I personally haven't, I mean, I guess we've been doing this 12 months now. We switched uh, for a history lesson with Stouty. We, st we were 7 p.m. Um, last year. We, we switched to 6 p.m. for this year, whereas it sounds like the other boards have moved to 5 p.m. But I personally haven't heard any um, complaints uh, among citizens of the county as to it being confusing. So I, I was just curious if any of you had or if um, planning staff uh, had heard anything. 
to that effect. I have not received any any feedback, uh, either positively or negatively, uh, on the start time. Right, likewise. Yeah. I had a handful last year of residents um, who asked that it not move prior to 6 p.m. simply for the fact that they work and if they're interested and want to attend, they can't get here at 5. So, um, you know, it, uh, I've adjusted, but some days it's still tough to get here right at 6, but we make it happen. So. Yeah, I'm, 6 has worked out for me. Um, I Where I would be reluctant, the main reason why I would be reluctant to move to 5 is if it makes it difficult for anyone up here in lieu of not hearing really any complaints complaints from the citizenry um I, so I'm, I'm personally i'm okay with staying at six um i i remain more concerned about the ability to recruit people who would be interested in serving as people step off um you know the earlier you go the more difficult it is for folks who are still working to, I mean, it impacts their day or their travel or their commute. I, I know for Mr. Richardson, getting from Norfolk to here by 6 o'clock was a push, too. So, um, you know, absent having Amazon or Google, you know, locate here, you know, we're still sending people to Newport News and Richmond and Norfolk to work. So, you know, I'm... I remain an advocate of, of six or seven o'clock just for the ability to. I think part of our job is to recruit people to serve on the different conditions that we have here. So, All right, thank you. That's helpful. I mean, does anyone else want to add anything? I feel the same way. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with six. Oh, yeah, I think six is a great time. Like we can right direction for six. Like, yeah, looks <laughs> like there's your direction. Okay. No worries at all. Um, Okay, uh, any, anyone else have any discussion or requests? All right, um, and then just final reminder that um, Mr. Holt already said this, but we, uh, we convene again um, on the 18th, Monday the 18th at 6 p.m. Um, to, uh, we'll vote in officers then and uh, we, the CIP. Um, there might okay. be some other stuff. An advertised or, uh, public calendar. hearing. <laughs> yep, advertised public hearing to consider the capital improvements. 6 p.m. is the right time because I thought last year we did it at 5. I'm not trying to be. No, nope, that's a good. I'm not trying to be funny, but I. Triple check. <laughs> Advertise. <laughs> Advertise for. Thanks. All right. Hey, can f up here. Chairman, <laughs> <laughs> motion to adjourn to March 18th at 6 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Kropp. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Uh,